special day. One, because, and most importantly, because it's Resurrection Sunday. How cool is that? Every Sunday is Easter for us. Isn't that great? All right? I don't get chocolate every Sunday from my wife, but it is Easter every Sunday. That's why we're here first and foremost. We serve a resurrected Savior who's hearing the praises of his people, who's hearing the prayers of his people. Amen. And that's why we're here first and foremost. We're also here to celebrate with some baptisms today. Come on. We've got some baptisms today. And we have others that want to. This weekend didn't work. We're going to be planning another one, maybe summer, first of the fall. But we're going to celebrate some baptisms today. Also, we have an exciting announcement to make about the future of our church. Yeah? After my sermon. To hear it and then not listen, okay? <laughs> so you gotta endure my sermon first, all right? And then we'll share some exciting news, okay? Uh, so very exciting times. Um, so uh, I'm sure that a lot of you uh, have one of these, all right, called a debit card right here, all right? Um, now you know how a debit card works, all right? It uh, allows you to take this little card and it gives the authority, whoever you hand that over to, it gives them the authority, right, to purchase anything that you've chosen to purchase. You're, you're able to not only just hand it to the cashier, but you can hand it to one of your kids. I mean, I don't. But you can if you want. And you hand one of your kids and give them the authority. Tell them the PIN number, right? And now they have the authority to be able to use your account, what you have stored up in your account. Now, someone could steal this, but they won't get far with mine, okay? In fact, one time someone stole our identity, they gave it back and apologized. And said they were gonna pray for us. I, I don't know what all that means. Uh, but the point is, right, the authority comes with the person who has the account, who has the resources, right? And my point is this, there is spiritual authority that Christ has because of who Christ is. And we're going to look at a passage today where we see that authority at work. And here's what's really exciting. Christ can give that authority to those of us who know him. So we have spiritual authority over things in our lives. How exciting is that this morning? I said, how exciting is that this morning? Come on, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 1, if you would, please. Mark chapter 1. Uh, we don't put the uh, words up on the screen. Uh, we do with our kind of proof text, but not our main text. So if you need a Bible, there's no, trust me, there's nothing wrong with that. Raise your hand. We have Bibles in the back. We'll get one to you if you want one of those. So uh, if you see the hands that are up, get them a Bible if you would. You can also uh, go, you know, obviously your phone. If you don't have a Bible with you, you want to turn the Bible path in your phone. Go to our app. We have a Church on the Rock app that has all the main points and the verses in there as well. But we are in a series through the book of Mark. And we're, we are saturating this book. This is a book about what it really means to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ. That is what this church is about. This church isn't about growing into a large, big church. If God chooses to do that, that's certainly up to him. This is about making disciples who are equipped to make disciples. Amen. That is the mission of this church. And so what better place to go to than the life of Jesus on what that looks like? What does that mean to be a disciple of Jesus and to serve and help make disciples in the name of Jesus? So we are going through the book of Mark verse by verse. In fact, we are taking our time, taking a little bit of the time, and we're going to be in the book of Mark. It's going to culminate and end next Easter, all right? So over the course of this year, I would like to think we would have a really good idea of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so we are a couple weeks into this, and uh, Jesus has just called the first four of his disciples and so he is beginning his public ministry. He's been baptized by John the Baptist, 
tested in the wilderness for 40 days, calls his first set of disciples, not all 12 yet, but four of them so far, and begins his public ministry. And right from the very beginning of the public ministry, we see the authority in which Jesus is going out in ministry. And again, I want to suggest to you, it's the same authority that's available to any person that has bowed a knee to Christ as Savior, Lord as Savior, and has the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. And so in the course of our time together this morning, and we're going to keep it somewhat shorter because of the announcement, because of baptism, which means I'll probably preach for an hour. Um, that, no, I'm kidding. We we'll keep it a little bit shorter, but I do want to look at three particular things as it relates to spiritual authority. So let's go ahead and get started. Verse 21 and 22. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. And they went, they, Jesus, and who was so far his disciples, they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Now, by the way, synagogues are different than the temple. One temple... All right, but synagogues were in, in many different cities, and this is where they would gather. The rabbis would gather with the people, the Jewish people, and they would teach from the scriptures. The rabbis, the scribes, they would teach. Jesus went in there as he began his public ministry, went into the synagogue to begin to teach. And it says in verse 22, and they were astonished. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had what? As one who had authority and not as the scribes. I don't think this was necessarily a dig on the scribes. The scribes were, were very respected by the people. But what did the scribes do? They interpreted the scriptures. Jesus was the scriptures. That's the difference. And that's why he could teach with authority. So the scribes did their best to try to interpret. And as Jesus' ministry would go on, we realized they interpreted some Old Testament prophecies the wrong way. Because many of them didn't believe that Jesus was the coming Messiah. But they did their best to try to interpret what the scriptures were. This is what they had of the scriptures at that time. But Jesus, they, they listened to Jesus, and there was something different about him. Even, even though these religious leaders could teach well, but there was some about Jesus, there was this authority that, that it was like they were hearing from God himself. Because they were hearing from God himself. And he spoke with authority. Here's the first of three things I want us to understand. Jesus had authority over Scripture. Jesus had authority over the scriptures. It's interesting. Divine revelation is two things. The written word and the living word. Special revelation. Like, like there's general revelation, right? Creation reveals something about God. But when you talk about special revelation, miraculous rev revelation, you have the written word of God, but you also have the living word of God. Jesus incarnate. He came in the flesh and he showed us. That's why in John chapter 1, he describes the coming of Jesus this way. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus was the living Word. And guess what? Jesus wrote the written Word. They used human agents to do it. It was through the Holy Spirit. But God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. You could say that all, all persons of God had wrote the Scriptures. It was the Holy Spirit who was given the responsibility to breathe that into human authors. That's what it tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's what we have here, not man's words. God used man's uh, personalities, man's experience in writing the word. But at the end of the day, he breathed into them to write the inerrant word of God. I love the way that John Frame in his book, The Doctrine of the Word of God, put it. He said, divine authorship is the ultimate reason why scripture is authoritative. Its authority is absolute because God's authority is absolute. And scripture is his personal, personal word to us. 
This, in your hand, is not like the Mormon Bible. It's not like any other religious writing. What separates what's in our hands from any other writing is that it was not written ultimately by a man. It was written by God himself through a man, through men. And so there's authority. There's responsibility that you and I have not to pick and choose, to cherry pick the parts we like or the parts we don't like. But it has the authority in our lives. We submit because these are not the words of man. These are the words of God. And so with it comes authority. And might I add to that power. Power. Sit under this in a daily basis. Sit under the word of God. Listen and obey. And you will start seeing your life transformed. Go and do a retreat is wonderful. Going on a missions trip is great. Those are wonderful things. But nothing replaces daily submitting to the written on, word of sir. God because it is breathed out by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And it has authority and power in our lives. <laughs> and here's the result of that according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching us, for reproofing us, for correcting us, and for training us in righteousness. I love this. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You want to be equipped? It's not a class. Well, classes are helpful. It's not a trip. Trips are helpful. You want to be equipped? Read and apply this to your lives. There is spiritual authority every time we open it. Why? Because it was written by God. That's right. Let's keep reading, verse 23 through 28. It goes on and says, And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. There are different interpretations of what that means, an unclean spirit. I understand this to be that, that, that a demon, at least a demon, is not more. We know from Scripture sometimes more than one can invade a body. Of a body of a person who doesn't know Christ. I don't believe any demon can invade a body of someone who knows Christ because they have the Holy Spirit of God in them. But I do believe still to this day that demons can possess human beings. So these unclean spirits, I understand them, are part of the one-third of the fallen angels that Revelation talks about that rebelled along with Satan. And so they're trying to what? Prevent the work of God. Sometimes they're in pretty miraculous kind of big ways like this, but it happens all the time. We know from Scripture that there were angels, both good and bad, assigned to different cities, different nations. It would not shock me at all if there were both good angels and, and bad fallen angels, demons, assigned to this church, trying to keep this church from fulfilling the mission of making disciples of all nations. It is time that we start taking spiritual warfare seriously. Just because we don't see a manifestation of it in a very, you know, like kind of a big way most of the time, doesn't mean that it's not happening. In fact, maybe that's some of the subtle approach, the, the, the strategy of Satan to make it subtle and not realize when de demonic oppression or demonic influence is happening. Listen, a believer cannot be demon-possessed, but he can be demon-influenced. And oftentimes, he masquerades as light. But just because we don't see people standing up with, with demon possessing them on a Sunday morning doesn't mean that there's a demonic influence happening. And we need to, be, we need to be understand that. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to understand this. Jesus has authority over the spirits too. How do I know that? Because as we see it throughout Scripture, let's keep reading. It says, he cried out, the, the spirit, all right, within this man. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I want to tell you, demons have better theology than most Christians. James chapter 1 says that, that, that they even shudder at who God is. They shudder at God more than Christians do. Demons know their theology. They know who God is and they know who His Son Jesus is. Even the, the religious leaders, the, the ones who were supposed to know it all, they didn't know who Jesus was. But this unclean spirit did. You're the Holy One of God. 
He calls him Jesus, so he identifies with his humanity, and he identifies him as the Holy One of God, identifying also with his deity. He understood that Jesus was both God and man in the flesh. He came as a man, but still remained God. Again, this is a great reminder. If Satan and his demons know their theology, don't think they won't try to use theology to trip us up. So don't assume everything you hear on the radio. Don't assume every pastor you listen to. Every quote-unquote Christian song you listen to. Don't make the assumption that it is accurate and right. Sit under the authority of the Word of God so that you can filter what is biblical and unbiblical. Because I'm here to say today, there's a lot of unbiblical teaching and worship out there today. We have to be students of the Word of God. We have to know our scriptures. Because it may not be a, a demon possession, but the, the demons will use theology and twist it and yeah. just a little bit to get us off the centrality of Christ and the gospel in our lives. It's my humble opinion is there are many churches in America today who have drifted from the gospel, the true and pure gospel of Jesus Christ. But Jesus, verse 25, rebuked him, saying, Be silent! Come out of him! And the unclean spirit, convulse, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. Jesus told him what to do, and he did it! And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. When we think about the authority of Jesus, Jesus had authority over scripture and Jesus had authority over spirits. You know what that means? It means we don't have to walk in fear. It means we don't have to be afraid of the evil one. We don't have to look at temptation and addictions and all of those things. And I'm not saying they're easy things, but we don't have to look at them and think that there's no way to victory in our lives. Right? When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price. He paid for all of our sins and affirmities on that cross. He has the authority over every spirit. In fact, 1 John 3, verse 8 and 9 says, the 8b says this, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. You hear nothing else, hear this. The only authority that Satan has in our life is the authority that we've given him. That's right. Matthew 10:1. when he goes to send out, this is a little bit later, than where we're at right now in the life of Christ. A little bit later, when he's formed the twelve, and he sends them out, says this in Matthew 10, 1. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. As the ministry began with Jesus, he passed the authority. He handed over the debit card. <laughs> And said, here you go. I give you the authority to use this over unclean spirits. And then he extended that, by the way, beyond the 12 to the 72. All right? A lot larger range of disciples. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20, it says this. The 72 returned with him with joy. Returning now, Jesus commissions them. He sends them out. They're returning now, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, Jesus was there before man was even created. Isaiah chapter 12 talks about it. Where Satan was cast out of heaven because of his rebellion. Jesus said, yeah, I know, I was there when he lost his first fight with us. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Yeah. 
I love that verse. I hate snakes. I hate snakes so bad. And I take this out of context. And sometimes I just quote this verse, and I know it's out of context probably, but I really hate snakes. But that's no, really have nothing to do with anything, so let's keep going. And I just hate snakes. And over all, come on now, over all the power of the enemy. Not over some of the power. Not over certain areas of power. But over all the power of the enemy, nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. But in other words, it's not like, yeah, we can do. But do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are suffering to you. More importantly, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yeah, yeah. The greatest joy is not that you have spiritual authority. The greatest joy is that he saved a sinner like you and me and allows us interest in the holy of holies. That's the greatest thing to do for us. And guess what, church? Even when we fail, even when we forget that spiritual authority, even when we stumble and fall, guess what? God still loves us Amen. as much as before we stumbled and fall. His love is unconditional. It doesn't mean there's a correction along the way when we stumble. But nothing changes how he views us because when God looks at his children, because Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, because he rose from the dead to defeat the power of sin, Satan, and, and death, because of that, when Christ looks on us, he doesn't still see sinners who still stumble from time to time. When he looks at us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's what he sees in us. All right, Satan is the one who wants us to forget our identity. Remember today your identity. You are a saved child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And with that comes a 4T. Now, I want to be careful for a second. Let me give you one more verse first, and I want to share a little bit of caution with you. 1 John 4, 4 says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Never forget that. Greater is he, and this is where I want to caution us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. There is a lot of differences within Christianity. And this is what I love about this church is, is, is we're, we're a non-denominational church, but we are very, very much biblically rooted. And we have core doctrine that we, 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 we hold to, very much so. But secondary issues, there are different people who come from different perspectives on some of these secondary issues, okay? So when some read this, they would see this from more of a dispensational, if you will, lenses that say that, that, that Jesus empowered them with that particular authority for the establishment of the church. And then others would look at this passage with different lenses than that and say, no, just like those disciples, we've been given that same authority in our own lives to heal people and to cast out yeah. demons, okay? There are people from both sides, and I'm not wimping out. I just don't want us to miss the greater point. The greater point is this. Whatever side that you rely on, can we at least agree on this? The authority ultimately isn't ours. The authority is Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We don't heal anybody. We don't cast out demons. Jesus can do that. And I would say still does that. Wherever you fit on, on, on sign gifts for today, God still performs miracles. God still heals. God still, still, still brings victory. All right? Jesus is still stronger than Satan. So I want to caution us to make sure that we understand this. The authority over sin, the authority... To see healing in people's lives comes with God. If someone comes forward for healing and I lay hands on them and I pray for healing and God turns around and heal, heals them, I never healed that person. I just by faith ask God to do what only God can do. Does that make sense? We have people, some people out there making it about them, like they're the healer. Uh -uh. Any, any healing that God could do. Is, is the, the only one that lived a sinless life. The only one that could die on a cross and then defeat death. Right. That's the only one that has the spiritual authority often. 
He transfers authority. He gives us spiritual authority and power in our lives. We must never remember that. Remember, excuse me, never forget that. <laughs> Jesus had authority over Scripture. He had authority over the spirits. And one more. Look at verse 29 through 34. It says, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Now this is Peter, okay? So Jesus uh, changed his name to, to Peter, which means the rock. Right, but sometimes the scripture still goes by Simon. Okay, so Peter and his brother Andrew, along with James and John, those are the four disciples at this point. Now Simon's mother-in-law, some of you don't realize this, that many of the disciples were married. They lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her, and he came, and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he held many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. The demons knew him. Most of the people didn't know who Jesus was. But he wasn't ready yet for the word he spoke. And that's why silence. Notice again, he's telling demons what they can and can't do. Come on. Amen. Jesus had authority over scripture. Jesus had authority over spirits. But Jesus also had and has authority over sickness. Sickness. Do you believe that God can heal any disease? Any sickness? I believe that he can. I believe that he can. But I want to say something, and this is where, again, not everyone agrees. All right? There's the one side that agree with me, and then there's the wrong side. All right. Now. <laughs> no. Trust me. I always joke when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to say is like, oh, okay. Now I get it. You know, okay, got a lot of them right. Like, okay, <laughs> you get every interpretation right. All right, um, but there's, I believe that there are times that healing doesn't happen because of a lack of faith. Scripture talks about that. But I also believe that sometimes healing doesn't happen because God, in His sovereignty, chooses to wait to heaven for that healing to happen. And I want to tell you, and that's a whole debate from Scripture we can have at some other time, but I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what this does because I've seen it. Someone is going through suffering and pain and heartache, and then they're told you just don't have enough faith. Or you would be. So now we add not only to the suffering, now we add to their life shame. Because they just weren't spiritual enough. I think God chooses to heal in the sovereignty. I don't think you can get around the New Testament and not see that, that there's an element of faith involved and, you know, how all that works together. You know, I've been a pastor for 30 years and trying to connect all those dots are still a challenge sometimes. You know, we talk about the free will of man and the sovereignty of God and election, free will, all these things. And it's, you know what, I, I'm not wimping out, but I, I've reached an age where, where I'm okay with the mysteries of God. Amen. But there's some things it's like, God is God and I am not. <laughs> and I try to understand it to the degree that I can understand it. But then I say, wow, I serve an infinite God. Right. And someday in heaven, I'll, I'll get how all that stuff works yeah. together connect all of those dots, our part, God's part, and how all that works to But I do think there's enough support in the New Testament where there is an impact on our faith or lack of faith. But I also believe, and I want to say it again, sometimes it is the will of God for someone to endure suffering this side of heaven for the greater glory of God in this kingdom. And that healing, that healing will happen. It's just on the other side of that right. happens. So I want to make sure that, that we understand that. We pray for healing here. 
if you uh, if you understood all the prayer that happens in the back and the, the front during during our times of prayer, we've seen answered prayer in all of those things. But we've seen God choose not to heal when we've prayed for it. And I've seen a lot of faith. My brother in Christ, my, my fellow elder, wife died of lung cancer just a month or so ago. She was a great woman of faith. My brother and friend Jim's a great man of faith. And this church prayed and prayed and prayed. And I would say that we did not fail in our praying. We succeeded because God heard the prayers of his people. And he sent her to, he sent her to heaven so she would no longer have any pain or any hurt in her life. Okay? Sometimes God chooses to allow us our suffering for his greater glory. We said that we should pray for healing because the scripture tells us to pray for healing. In fact, look at James chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is, is, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is great power as it is working. There is great power in people praying by faith. But God in his sovereignty still allows suffering. He allowed our Savior to suffer. In his humanness, in the emotions of his human side, Jesus cried out in the Garden of Gethsemane, Take this cup from me. But not my will be done, but yours. Thank you, Jesus! God allowed his Son to suffer for the greater glory. God always does what is best for our good and his glory. And even if we can't connect those dots, sometimes that is to not win him, to allow a sickness. We should pray by faith for it and then trust God by faith that God in his sovereignty and compassion and mercy will answer it as he sees it. Best. Come on, church. Amen. <laughs> well, as I wrap it up this morning, as we look at the authority of Jesus, his spiritual authority over the scriptures and the spirits and sickness, let me give you three applications. I'm not going to spend much time here because of uh, the things we need to do. But I'm going to give you three. So if you want to jot these down somewhere, how do I apply this? What's the application to this? Number one. In light of the spiritual authority of Christ, number one, are you daily living under the authority of God's word? If God's word has that kind of authority to it, do we, do we, do we have a sense of urgency to be in it each day? Or do we just sneak it in if we have time? I'll try to fit it in. I'm really busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. I'm going to do my best. I'll try to get to it. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I love you, but if Sunday is the only time you are receiving the meat of God's word, you are going to remain spiritually scrawny. Scrawny. Scrawny and weak. Thank you. We need, we need to nourish. We need it. If it has that kind of authority, we believe that. And we have a sense of urgency to sit under the authority of Christ in the Word. Number two, are you facing Satan's attacks with the confidence and authority that's yours in Christ? We walk as conquerors. Maybe, a little, maybe it's okay to have a little spiritual swagger. Huh? I don't know, we're always walking like this sometimes. Oh, poor me, work. Just come back, Jesus. I can't endure no more. Listen, I'm not minimizing. We, go, we all go through weakness and sadness. Please, I'm not mocking that. All right? I'm not, I promise you. But at the same time, we have to remember who we are. We have to remember whose we are. According to Romans 8, I'm a conqueror. Scripture said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 
according to Jesus, the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. So why would I walk in fear? Why would I walk scared? Why would I say, you know, oh, Lord, just take me home now. No, you know what we should say? Lord, take me home when you want to, but till you come, I'm going to make a difference because I got the Spirit of God indwelling me. Savior, who's going to do what is best for our good and his glory. 